Daybreak Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Potty Washington. Today is Thursday, March 16th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. An Ethiopian human rights monitor says he had a fruitful and positive meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Blinken. Transitional justice is one of the key recommendations from our joint investigation report that my commission did together with the UN Human Rights Office. And I'm glad that uh, transitional justice is one of the points in the Pretoria Peace Agreement. We'll have analysis of Secretary Blinken's two-nation Africa visit. A Sudanese delegation visits South Sudan to monitor that country's peace process. Nigeria's PDP says its court petition is alive and well. Despite reports, a court has struck it down. Malawi's president assures maximum assistance to Cyclone Freddy survivors. Jaguera said his government has set aside about 1.6 million US dollars to assist thousands of people affected and displaced by the cyclone. And Egypt cracks down on dissidents overseas. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. A Sudanese delegation is in Juba to follow up on the implementation of the South Sudan 2018 peace deal. Sudan's acting foreign minister says the delegation is in the South Sudanese capital to learn more about how the peace process is going and to meet with signatories of the deal. Michael Atit has this report for viewing from Khartoum. The Sudanese delegation, headed by Sudan Sovereign Council member Shamsuddin Kabachi, Sudanese Defense Minister Yassin Ibrahim, and Acting Foreign Minister Ali Sadiq, met with South Sudan's President Salva Kiir yesterday and discussed the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement. In audio provided to this program by the Sudan News Agency, Osuna, Minister Sadiq said the visit is happening within the framework of efforts by regional bloc IGAT to establish security, peace and stability in the region and South Sudan in particular. Sadiq said Kir updated the delegation on the progress made on the implementing the peace deal along with challenges facing the process. Sadiq says Sudan is keen to ensure that South Sudan is stable and peace there will impact positively on the stability of neighboring Sudan and the entire region. The content of this meeting focused on reviewing what Sudan can do together with signatures to reach a compromise on the situation in South Sudan. We wanted to ensure that the current transitional period is smoothly implemented accordingly, which should lead to the national election in the country. Sudan and Uganda are the guarantors of South Sudan's peace agreement signed in September 2018 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Last month, signatories to the deal agreed to extend the transitional period by another two years. Last week, tensions escalated when Kiir fired Defense Minister Angelina Tenj of the SPLM IO and the Minister of Interior Mahmoud Solomon of the SPLM IG. Sadiq says President Kiir and First Vice President Riyak Machar told the Sudanese delegation they will work with the country's leaders to resolve the matter in an amicable way. <laughs> We have observed optimism and brotherly spirit during our meetings, and we are keen to ensure that they continue with this spirit until reaching a consensus among the parties which will reflect positively to the two countries and IGAD countries. Sadiq says the delegation also briefed South Sudanese officials on the ongoing political situation in Sudan. Sudan's military and pro-democracy civilian government leaders have been locked in a political stalemate over the way forward since the military leaders said they would step aside and allow a civilian-led government to take over. Michael Atid for VOA News, Khartoum. Human Rights Watch says Egyptian authorities are cracking down on dissidents overseas for refusing to provide them with passports and other identity documents. Reporter Elysia Fokman has more from Tunis. Human Rights Watch reports that the Egyptian authorities move to withhold or fail to renew personal identity documents, such as passports and ID cards, is making life difficult for dissidents, activists and journalists living abroad. Human Rights Watch interviewed dozens of victims, but estimates that potentially tens of thousands of exiles are affected. It says the policy is effectively a crackdown on opposition voices beyond the borders of Egypt, under the leadership of President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. 
Sisi. Ahmed Ben Shemsi, the spokesman for Human Rights Watch on Middle East and North Africa, explains the effect of the move on Egyptians living overseas. The denial of current ID documents, including passports, uh, prevents Egyptians abroad uh, to go on with their lives in a normal way. You cannot travel when you don't have a passport. You cannot apply to a lot of, of services, including residency uh, permit in the country that hosts you, including work permit. Sometimes you cannot apply to health services or education services. Uh, when you have a child born out of the country and you don't have a birth certificate, how can you re register that child in school? Ben Shemsi says that Egyptians who the authorities have listed as dissidents cannot challenge the consul's refusal to provide them with papers because they never receive a decision in writing. In fact, for some, even going to the consular office can be dangerous. I spoke to one such distant living in Turkey who spoke to us under the conditions of anonymity to protect his family still living in Egypt. He fled to Turkey in 2019 after serving five years in prison for his activism. He has a disabled brother still in prison who he says has suffered grave mistreatment at the hands of the authorities. In 2021, I went to the Egyptian consulate to organize a power of attorney for my family to take care of my affairs in Egypt. Normally, it's a simple procedure. They took my passport and after waiting over four hours, the consular worker said a police officer wanted to speak to me on the phone. The police officer told me I was a wanted man and inside the consul I was on Egyptian territory and under their authority. It was a kidnapping attempt, so I just ran out of the door. I had to threaten to call the Turkish police and after a lot of arguing, the consular services threw my passport out the door onto the street. Since then, Egyptian authorities have refused to give me any ID papers. I have received death threats from the authorities and warned off contacting any other victims of Egyptian authorities. Thankfully, now I have a Turkish passport. For Voice of America Africa, I'm Elysia Falkman in Tunis. Tun <laughs> U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken continues his two-nation Africa trip today, Thursday, as he goes to Niger. He concluded his visit to Ethiopia on Wednesday, where he met with Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and discussed a range of issues, including a sustainable peace following the Tigray conflict. The State Department says Blinken and Abiy also discussed accountability for alleged atrocities committed by both the Ethiopian federal government forces and the Tigrayan people. People's liberation from the TPLF. Dr. Daniel Bekele is the head of Ethiopia's government appointed Human Rights Commission. He is one of those from civil society who met with Secretary Blinken on Wednesday. Dr. Bekele tells me that they had a positive and fruitful discussion with the Secretary, particularly concerning rights and transitional justice in Ethiopia. Transitional justice is one of the key recommendations from our joint investigation report that my commission did together with the UN Human Rights Office. And I'm glad that uh, transitional justice is one of uh, the points in the Pretoria Peace Agreement. Uh, and since the Pretoria Peace Agreement, there have been some concrete uh, positive steps forward in terms of cessation of hostilities, gradual restoration of uh, services, and better inflow of humanitarian assistance. And... Uh, access to uh, several parts of uh, Tigray region which were previously inaccessible. And one other component that we uh, are working on is on uh, justice and accountability, but uh, justice and accountability in its broad sense, uh, which includes uh, the search for uh, truth, you know, seeking and telling the truth, uh, reparation for victims and uh, criminal prosecution and accountability for the most serious crimes and some necessary institutional and legislative, including constitutional reforms that may be necessary to ensure non-recurrence of such violations. Ethiopia really needs a victim-centered, human rights compliant, credible transitional justice process, and I'm glad to see that that process has started in Ethiopia and the international community is providing support for this critical process in Ethiopia. I think the secretary also announced some uh, monetary assistance, $331 million for the displaced in Ethiopia. What can you tell us about the displaced people? The conflict in Ethiopia has displaced a large number of people in several regions, including Tigray, Afar, Amhara, Oromia, and other regions as well, you know. But we also have uh, Ethiopians uh, who were forced to cross the border and who are now 
refugees in neighboring countries. So there is a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, rehabilitation of affected areas, affected communities, and resettlement of uh, IDPs as well as refugees uh, to their original places of residence. That's why Ethiopia needs uh, such a transitional justice process, one objective of which is reparation of victims and returning back uh, people into their original place of residence and giving back their livelihoods. And which is why uh, international support and uh, full spectrum of uh, economic and development support to Ethiopia is badly needed at this point because affected communities need uh, to be supported in reparations and in uh, basically resuming their lives. On U.S.-Ethiopia relations, we know that economically there have been some uh, U.S. sanctions, particularly considering Ethiopia for the AGOA project. I think the secretary has to announce uh, overall uh, relations and developments at the end of his visit. Uh, but I uh, understand that uh, the secretary's visit in and of itself is uh, a step in the right direction, is a positive step in terms of re-establishment of relations between Ethiopia and the United States, which was a very long uh, bilateral relationship between the two countries. And I, I also believe that uh, U.S. relation with Ethiopia is also very important uh, to support the human rights work we do in Ethiopia. But I, I believe, you know, his visit by itself uh, is a step in the right direction and uh, is leading to uh, re-establishment of relations it was before to add a full spectrum of uh, development support, cooperation and partnership in all aspects of the relationship between the two countries. Dr. Daniel Bekele is the Chief Commissioner of Ethiopia's Human Rights Commission. He was speaking with us from Addis Ababa. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in Addis Ababa to talk about reaching lasting peace in Tigray on Wednesday while both sides tried to repair diplomatic ties that were strained by the civil war. The State Department said the two also discussed the importance of accountability for atrocities committed by all parties during the two-year war. Why is Ethiopia so important to the U.S.? Viewers Carol Van Dam put that question to Vanda Felbar Brown, a senior fellow at the Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology at the Brokens Institute in Washington, D.C. It's a very large, populous country with a hefty military force in the Horn of Africa and um, has been for two decades a U.S. principal ally in counterterrorism uh, issues in the region that have not gone away. Uh, Ethiopia plays uh, still a very important role in the fight against al-Shabaab. And in fact, there is expectation that Ethiopia will be uh, deploying more forces to Somalia in the very near future. So the counterterrorism agenda is a very important agenda. Second, I think there is an important uh, realization in the United States that the instability in Ethiopia goes far beyond the Tigray region. Tremendous explosiveness uh, remains in various parts of the country that with all the horror and suffering that the war in the Tigray region brought, Uh, could even be dwarfed uh, if um, Oromia uh, broke out into extended fighting. Also, the issue of uh, Amara is is far from settled. So you're Um, saying that you think they talked about more than just Tigray. They talked about these other regions that you mentioned because they're worried it could even get bigger. It could expand. Certainly, Oromia and the instability on Oromia was on the agenda, appropriately so, because absolutely uh, fighting could erupt in other parts of the country, Oromia. Um, And finally, um, the United States has become very concerned about the rise of uh, China across Africa. Now, in my view, uh, U.S. policy should not be uh, sacrificing important interests, important values, simply to be there to counter China. And just because uh, Prime Minister Abe had close relations with China, one of the actors that was supporting him, without concern for human rights, with kind of an open-ended commitment, some um, uh, have been pushing for full normalization with Ethiopia. My view would be premature. Ethiopia is an important country. It's an ally. Throughout the war in Tigray, the United States was trying to emphasize that it doesn't want rupture with Ethiopia but it wants to uh, Ethiopia 
the government of, in Addis Abeba to behave well. And so, so are you saying that there could be middle ground, like we don't have to go for the full normalization if we're talking to them, we're keeping the lines of communication open and things are getting better, but we may not do full normalization of ties? Right. I, th I think that would be the right calibration currently. Clearly, uh, Ethiopia has moved forward. There is a peace deal. The peace deal is challenged in many aspects of the implementation, both on the Tigray side and on the Ethiopian side. But there is peace. There is no more fighting. There is more access, humanitarian access to the Tigray region. People in the Tigray area are still starving, but they're not blockaded by the Ethiopian government. So clearly, there needs to be recognition and reward for those important steps. That was Vanda Felbar Brown, a senior fellow at the Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy and Technology at the Brokens Institute. She was speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam in Washington. Malawian President Lazaro Chakwera has assured people displaced by Cyclone Freddy that they will get the assistance they need. Chakwera made the announcement Wednesday when he visited evacuation camps in Blantyre. He also attended a mass funeral for the storm's victims. The record tropical cyclone has killed more than 200 people in Malawi and scores more in neighboring Mozambique. Lamek Masina reports. From this was the first time for President Lazarus Chakwera to evacuation camps since he declared a state of disaster in all flood hit areas this week. Chakwera said his government has set aside about 1.6 million US dollars to assist thousands of people affected and displaced by the cyclone in 10 districts in southern Malawi. He says, as the president, I will soon call for a cabinet meeting to endorse what we have so far far budgeted for the crisis, because if we try to follow financial approval procedures, we will put lives of the victims at risk. The displaced people say they are lacking food, clothes, clean water, and soap. During the president's visit, the government donated various relief items, including flour, clothes, and buckets to the victims. Jaguera also attended a mass funeral for some 28 people killed by the storm. The president said his government has asked neighboring countries to assist Malawi with rescue airplanes to complement the search and rescue efforts underway in the country. Authorities in Malawi say more than 35 roads have been impacted by the floods, making it difficult to provide help to many cyclone victims. He says we are currently consulting our development partners for assistance, although they also are facing various problems. He says we want them to assist us so we can assist our people who are badly affected by Cyclone Friday. Namita Biggins is the public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Malawi. She said in an audio statement Tuesday, that the U.S. government, through its various agencies, is responding immediately to the crisis. We are providing emergency shelters to affected households in Nsanje and Chikwawa through our existing $2 million support through Catholic Relief Services. USAID has also initiated the process of swiftly allocating additional life-saving resources to provide essential humanitarian assistance to include blankets, buckets, tarps, chlorine tablets to ensure clean water, mosquito nets, and more. In said USAID has a staff on the ground coordinating closely with the emergency operations center in Blanta to determine how the U.S. government can support the government of Malawi in reaching the hardest hit communities, whether experts in Malawi say Cyclone Freddy has now weakened, but the rains would continue for the next few days, largely because of an incoming weather front from Congo. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Potter in Washington. Today is Thursday, March 16. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.
In Nigeria, one of the lawyers for presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar's People's Democratic Party, the PDP, says its court petition still stands. This, despite local media reports that the presidential election petition court had Wednesday dismissed their appeal. The PDP had asked the court to compel the Independent National Elections Commission, INEC, to allow the PDP to observe the reconfiguration of the bimodal voter accreditation system, also known as Beavers. Sam Mike Ozikome, one of the lawyers for Atiku Abubakar, tells me that the court did not dismiss their petition and that the media report is fake news. There was no case of Atiku that was dismissed. Rather, what did happen is that yesterday, myself, Joe Gazama, SCN, Dr. Gaba Tetegi, SCN, my humble self, Professor Michael Ozikome, SCN, we led the Atiku PDP team to INEC headquarters and we met with the INEC senior management and in the course of our discussion he told us that we have seen our application before the court of appeal at the presidential tribunal and in our application we we're asking the tribunal to allow us access to the givers and also to allow us to be with INEC officials and staff when they will be doing the sorting of the votes. So the legal advisor, the third senior INEC official, senior advocate of Nigeria, now told us that all the givers were ready and that they will be made available to us today. As I speak to you, they have made those givers available to us today, over 11,000 pages, the giver report. He also told us that the issue of sorting did not arise at all because the votes of the presidential election were never missed. The votes cast for president were different from those cast for Senate and were also different from those cast for members of the House. And if they were never mixed together, the question in our application of trying to sort them out did not arise. And then we told him that he had to put these things in writing for us, that he would cooperate with us to see all these votes across the states and that the votes cast for the president, Senate, and the House of Representatives are different and in their own boxes retrievable whenever we wanted them. So based on that, it meant that our application, which we had filed at the Court of Appeal, asking for this thing, had been overtaken through this assurance of INEC. So all we did today when we went to the court, we now went to the Court of Appeal today to withdraw the application by ourselves. Because what we wanted to achieve through the application has been granted to us. So as far as you're concerned, your petition challenging or to look at the voting beavers still remains. Are you still challenging that process? Of course. We have not even yet filed the petition. We are seeking this evidence. This is what we call pre-trial period. Pre-trial period is when you come up with these applications, all of which are interlocutory. We have not yet filed the main petition. We need all these documents, all these givers, all these backends, all this um, uh, evidence in the cloud, all this uploading, all this planning. We need all of them to enable us to file our petition. Sam Mike Ozikome is one of the lawyers for Atiku Abubakar. He was speaking with us from Nigeria's capital, Abuja.